I'm Lindsay Moore and welcome to my podcast, In Conversation with SMEs, or Seriously Motivated Entrepreneurs. Founder of Agnes Marketing, I'm a business development and marketing advisor to small businesses. In challenging times like these, we need to support our small businesses more than ever. So my aim through this podcast is to bring inspiration, motivation and energy to those looking to start, scale or pivot their business by hearing the stories of others who have been brave, followed their heart, kept their nerve and achieved something quite remarkable. Throughout this series, I'll be speaking to my favourite small businesses and acclaimed entrepreneurs and asking them about their highs, their lows, their wish I'd knowns and what single piece of advice they would give themselves now if they were starting out. In this episode, I speak to Rachel Clacker, CBE, and I can't tell you how much I enjoy doing this interview. Rachel set up Money Penny in 2000 with her brother after they identified a gap in the market for providing telephone answering and outsourced switchboard support to businesses and sole traders. Money Penny is now the world leader in this field, with a team of over 750 people handling over 15 million customer interactions annually on behalf of their clients. And Rachel shares throughout this interview her experience of what it's been like growing Money Penny from a startup to the international business it is today. Known as the happiest office in the land, Money Penny is listed in the Sunday Times top 20 100 best companies to work for in the UK. So during our conversation, Rachel provides a whole host of insight and advice that I think businesses at all stages of growth will get a lot from. I particularly enjoyed the insights she gave us into the importance of focusing on quality rather than growth and the importance of getting the detail right. And towards the end of the interview, I asked her about advice she would give her younger self if she was starting out now. And she shares some great nuggets there. One being never take no for an answer. Rachel, it's lovely, really lovely to have to talk to you this afternoon. It's a real treat. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Great to be here virtually. It's lovely. I know, a virtual <laughs> catch-up. You can't beat it. Okay. I'm really interested to talk to you about Money Penny and the journey you've been on. So for those people who may not know Money Penny, um, I'll just explain that I know a little bit about your story and I'm looking forward to finding out more about it. But back in 2000, you, you armed with £10,000 and a big idea yourself and your brother Ed set up Money Penny, which is um, now the world's leading provider of telephone answering, outsourced switchboard and live chat services across the UK and America. And I'd just like to know, what did you do before it? And how did, where did the idea for Money Penny came about? And what was, you know, how did you start it? Um, well, basically, you know, pre Money Penny, I had had a career in in marketing, in film and PR, and um, and and marketing the arts. And my brother and I lived fairly close to each other, and we kind of supported each other in our individual businesses. And Ed, my brother, had a a business called Art Graphics, and he did flags and banners and you know vehicle graphics and things like that. Um, and basically, he'd, he'd done an awful lot of windsurfing, and out of that, he'd ended up getting into, you know, branding at sports events, and then doing flags and banners for councils and things. And you know, so so big organisations that he was working for, and essentially they were organisations that would have had a blue fit if they'd realised he was working from his back bedroom. So it certainly wasn't as acceptable then as it is now, you know, just to be a, a woman. Yeah. And um, and he had a real problem in his business, um, and that was that he couldn't be in answering his calls as well as being out sticking up his flags and banners and vehicle graphics um and so we you know as we supported each other with with our individual businesses we often had a chat about you know other people must have this problem why you know how do they solve it um and then through that we ended up actually finding having to go and look for and find a telephone answering service so we found a service based down south um and they did an absolutely you know a great job fred um, to the extent that he 
he eventually felt able to go away on holiday because he was running run his own business. So, so what what you know the way it worked was that just using standard BT features, he could divert his phone when his phone was engaged or unanswered to this business in Newbury, I think it was in, um, and they would answer the phone and say, "Good morning, Art Graphics. How can I help you?" And then the person at the end of the phone would pop, you know, say, "Hi, Joe Bloggs here," um, and then they would take a message and they would fax this through back to Ed's office. So while Ed, because this is in the days before internet and, you know, it's, it's incredible, isn't it? I mean, it, it, it's long yeah. 20 years ago, but it was only 20 years ago. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, then that worked so brilliantly for Ed because he felt that he could be out doing his work. And then when he came back, all of his messages were sitting there waiting for him on his fax machine. Off he goes on holiday to Greece, windsurfing. Um, I'm meant to be responsible for his office. Um, I screw up and forget to fill the fax machine with paper. Um, one of his biggest, I don't know, you'll remember, or anybody who's my age will remember that fax machines used to ring out when they'd run out of paper at the other end. So one of yeah. his biggest clients yeah. was trying to fax through a reorder, um, and it was kind of a life-changing order for Ed at that time, um, trying to fax through a reorder. Fax machine was ringing out. The client rings the office, gets diverted to the telephone answering service. Good morning, Art Graphics, how can I help you? Can you please fix your fax machine because it's run out of paper? Oh, I can't do that because I'm only a telephone answering service. So really, you know, I mean, a story that, that still happens today a million times a day, isn't it? And people not being helpful at the end of the phone. Um, and um, but then, you know, so Ed, not terribly happy, frantic calls me, Rachel, get, get her out to the office. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, he lost this big order. Um, and, you know, after that, there ensued a load of nights around our kitchen table over bottles of wine asking the question, why can't there be a telephone option service where the person who looks after your calls is someone that you know and trust, you know, someone that adds value to your business? And it was such a simple idea. And we just couldn't work out why that couldn't be the case. Um, and then we, you know, did a bit more research and realized that nobody else had asked that question. Nobody else was was offering you know everybody who was in that space and there are you know loads of business that do that look after telephone calls um were actually saw themselves as technology businesses rather than people businesses um and so we thought well great let's let's set up an, a, a service where the person who looks after your calls is someone that you you know that you know and you trust and who who adds value so it was a really simple idea we knew nothing about telephones we knew nothing about um setting up a business we knew nothing about all sorts of things, but the only thing but the only thing that we knew was how it felt to be a client. And I think that was the most important thing to know because it meant that we approached the whole, you know, the whole thing of setting up this business from a people angle. You know, if we're a client, so, we, you know, we, we wrote lots of lists. What would we want if we were a client, you know, working for Money Penny, working with Money Penny? What would we want if we were um, a member of the team working for Money Penny? And what we wanted, we were a supplier to Money Penny. So we wrote these lists, and we set up the business to answer those lists, essentially. And and it, was it just the two of you in the business from the start? So were you actually taking the calls? Oh yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. I mean, we <clears throat> we had um, we had no money. So we say we had ten thousand pounds. We might have had fifteen thousand pounds. I don't know. We were looking down the back of an awful lot of sofas um, at the time, <laughs> and. So, yeah, I mean, it, this wasn't a matter of raising, you know, raising finance and whatever. We had a £16,000 overdraft from NatWest Bank. Um, we had um, a loan from um, our, our aunt, an aunt, um, who loaned us £16,000. And we had £10,000 of our own savings. And we... Um, so the loan with, from Di, our aunt, was, you know, we insisted that was paid back on commercial terms. Um, and obviously the overdraft is on commercial terms of the bank. And um, so, you know, we had to keep it very, very simple. We had to grow very slowly. Um, and I, in my previous life working for in arts marketing, had done a load of um, database work for theatres. So I actually spoke to somebody who'd done a database, uh, some, I'd done some database work that said, you know, Rob, can you write us a database? a piece of access software. I didn't know anything about a software um, that, that can do X, Y, and Z. And he said, yeah, I think so. So um, he did that. Um, we bought a very basic telephone answering system and, you know, somehow we made it work. But literally in the first days, yeah, I would be, the system would recognise a number that somebody was calling in on. So basically we gave every client their own number. We still do. 
so a system would recognize that it was from Lindsay Moore or you know whatever and you'd answer yes. it in the company name and then literally in the first days we were typing up a message and going over the fax machine you know, and faxing it through to our clients and then of course that that became more and more you know, that that was very very early on and then we as we could inform, afford to invest in our software we could then put the calls through to our clients so we weren't just taking messages we were actually acting as a receptionist for them and so it's developed and but the, the best thing that ever happened to us, I think, was having no money because yeah. what that meant was that we had to, we couldn't afford to buy software, so we had to write our own software. And we ended up, you know, we learned so much along the way, but we ended up, um, Rob, who was who wrote the software for us, you know, he actually had the rights to that software, you know, which seems bizarre to me that, that someone you commission holds the rights to it. So we actually, he kept his original price um, for the project in the first instance, although that he spent an extraordinary, you know, much more time on it than than we could afford to pay for. But then a few years later, we actually bought the rights to that software from him. Um, so hopefully in the round, he got, yeah. you know, what he needed for his, um, for his efforts, because he was amazing. Um, but also it meant that we were absolutely in control of our own destiny because we ma we manage the software that's sat at the heart of what we do and i and i don't mean to you know we need that software to to be really quick and efficient and right so that our people could be amazing and that uh, and it's it sounds such an obvious thing to say that but now in 2020 but in tw 2000 that was a very progressive i mean a lot of people were just getting on email and you know to me was that really very that was a very innovative approach to setting up a new business you obviously knew that technology well no well we didn't we just had to i mean luckily ed's brain works in that way so he could actually he took on the whole technology piece um and you know and his brain still does you know still does yeah. thankfully it's so much so complex now i've got no idea but at that time, we we completely underestimated how important technology was going to be. We just thought, you know, it's simple. We just buy a phone system, um, and and I just think it was really lucky that we couldn't afford to buy the software that would accompany that. Because had we done that, we would have been tied into someone else's software. We wouldn't have been able to afford afford it, afford to grow. We wouldn't have been masters of our own destiny. Because as by owning it, we've managed to bolt on bits over the years. So now we've got this extraordinary platform that we operate on, of which I understand nothing. Um, but it does, you know, now we're managing, you know, we're managing 50,000, 60,000 calls a day and that number of live chats a day at the moment. And, and it's all managed on one platform that started off, and we call it Rita, but it started off as this tiny thing way back, you know, when, when it was just the two of us. Wow. So, Yeah. So, so I, I, you know, it, it worries me that all these, there's so much talk, isn't there, about seed funding for businesses and whatever. And absolutely, I, you know, I get that. But there is something about scarcity, you know, driving innovation and, you know, necessity, making people be creative and be more, um, more resourceful. Because um, certainly had we had more money, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have had that opportunity to, to have our own software. And I mean, literally going from yourself and Ed taking the calls and running over to the fax machine and then putting putting the messages through the fax. How how were those first few years? I mean, how how do, how do you go from that to how long was it before you employed somebody? And how how did you find those early years getting funding or backing or because that's fascinating to me how you go well, from. Well, we... No, nobody would lend us any money you know we didn't have a track record we had nothing um but what so we realized that um our pricing model had to support our lack of funds um and so we looked at how mobile phone companies were charging for their services which is basically they charge you a you know as we know they charge you a rate for the months to come but then they charge you in arrears for the month that's just gone on for that, that's just gone on for anything over and above your standard package. So we adopted that, and what that allowed us to do, and then we we actually invoiced every day of the month. So we had money coming in every single day. So every day, you know, my job was to look at the invoices, send them out. Oh, that's a great get, idea. So so we had cash flow every you know, yeah. kind of, you know, so it was a monthly income from every client, um, and. That was, you know, vitally important. 
um, because I say, you know, we had no funds. And then we just grew organically. So as as we had money in the bank, you know, we, we would not spend one penny that we didn't have. Um, we would then recruit another PA. Um, she would be, she or he, you know, would be able to take on more clients. Those new clients would then take their, would then um, pay their bills, and then we could afford to, rec- we could then afford to do a bit more marketing. So we had a marketing formula. It was all direct mail in those days. So we knew that if we sent out X pieces of direct mail, we'd get Y return. We'd invest in the marketing, and then we'd be able to recruit another PA, and then she'd be able to take on more clients. And we literally grew like that organically for. For 20, well, 20, I mean, essentially for 20 years, for 18 years, yeah, without, without borrowing one penny from anybody. So I found that really interesting when you said you invoice every day, because to be honest, that's quite an eye opener for me, because the, in my experience, the majority of businesses all wait till month end and they send them all, they send all the invoices out. But that's a game changer from a cash flow perspective, isn't it? Because if you invoice someone at the beginning of the month and the 30 days, like you still get it at the end of the month when you maybe already would have yeah you know, yeah absolutely doing the, doing the whole the round of the invoice round when you when you say you grew organically when you did were you always very ambitious the pair of you from the start did you was this always going to be more were you growing something more than a salary for you both when you oh, said absolutely that? absolutely I mean for, for years uh, you know because we'd worked together supporting each other's businesses we talked about you know setting up a business together and had all sorts of various ideas but no there was no um you know I get asked this question quite a lot and I I can't say that in year one we expected to be you know 20 years later as we are now um because that was just you know that that horizon was just too far away but we certainly knew that we had a very simple idea and that we could make a massive impact and um our shared commitment was that we would be the very best at what we do and that we would, in terms of that list I was talking about, we, you know, what would we want if we were a client working for Moneypenny? We'd want to work with a company that has integrity, that is honest and open about its pricing, that offers the most extraordinary levels of service, that offers great relationships with great people, that does, keeps its promises, all those kind of things. And I actually think that that all of that was about us realizing the ambition of this idea that we had and it just always felt like it would work it but only because of that commitment to our service um so our ambitions were always around being you know absolutely raising and challenging the standard in terms of what we do and adding value to our clients businesses um and then the money the money came later you know yeah. So we were, our ambition wasn't about money or about size of business. It was about our service. Um, and I really think that's the right way around. I mean, you know, at the time, we as I say we didn't know. We just had this very strong shared value set, mm. um, which was all about service. And I think that if our shared value set had been all about money, we would have fallen yeah. over at the first hurdle. Well, it's interesting that, isn't it? Because it's it's it it would have been it would have been for many the sell would have been do you want to buy a telephone answering service because you've got a problem and we've got a solution it sounds to me that you went in selling a set of promises that you could hand on heart deliver because that's what your ambition was to 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 pull off those to pull off those promises absolutely absolutely and and also what was really important was that we in those in those early days, you know, Ed and I were looking after the calls, you know, we were speaking to our clients and we realised that our clients want that relationship. You know, they didn't want, they, and we all know that we all buy from relationships, don't we now, you know, and that our clients wanted to know who the person was looking after the calls, and whatever. So we decided to be even more transparent about how we worked and would say, yes, you know, here is, you know, one of our first employees was Lynn, you know, she's still with us today. And you'd say, okay, so Lynn will look after the majority of your calls. We'd love her to look after all your calls, but she's not going to be able to. But actually when she's not here, that will overflow to her teammate, Jen, or, you know, so we we're really transparent with the clients. The clients go, yeah, that's great. I get that. You know, whereas if we'd actually made the promises, yes, you know, this one person is going to look after hundred percent of your calls. We're just going to fail. But I think it's not being very, just saying we are going to do this to the very best of our ability and we're going to be completely transparent with you in the way that we do it. And along the way, we're going to offer an amazing service to your clients. And to your callers. 
And those values or those sets of promises, really, um, that you made to the, to your clients. I mean, I've had the pleasure of going to Money Penny and, and meeting some members of your team, and I'm, and that's why I was keen to talk to you today because for me, you're a very different type of business because those values translate very much internally, and I and I know that you the environment that you provide to the people who work at Money Penny is an environment of integrity, of a place where people feel safe and secure and nurtured and are able to able to thrive really because they they feel that they're part of something quite special and um I know that you've got some extraordinary t- stories of how people almost have adopted your values and how they're living them through the roles that they play within Money Penny. For me, as an outsider looking in, I can't separate the business from you because those values that you have just described having from the very beginning have impacted every element of the business from what I can see as well. And um, um, do you do you think that is part of a big important part of why Money Penny has been a success and why people enjoy working there? So absolutely. But you know, Ed and I weren't clever enough to think that that you know we weren't this wasn't anything we did deliberately, you know, in terms of the, we weren't clever enough to do that. But I think that in the, today's world People can be clever enough to do that because we re- there's a much more conversation about how people thrive when they are trusted, when they um, are given opportunity, when they are supported. Um, so, yeah, so we, we, we just did. We were so committed to this idea. You know, we were working a gazillion hours a week and we, we did, had done every job within the business. So anybody that was joining us, they knew that we knew exactly what you know, where their pain was, where their joy was, all, all those kind of things. Um, but I think a lot of it does come down to trust and and who who is the most important person in the business. And so I am very clear, or we are very clear that Ed and I, for a very, very long time, have not been remotely important to the business. The most important people in our business are the people who are looking after our clients' calls and live chat. Um, because you know, the minute one of our team is already on a call or already on a chat, she's not available to her client. The minute, so there's a real balance of that availability for our clients. Um, The minute one of our, you know, team is on holiday or on a sick day or whatever that affects our clients. Um, And if I can trust somebody to take one call on behalf of one of our clients, then that is the biggest, the biggest thing I can entrust anybody with in, you know, in the world, really. Um, because that is exactly what we do. We are only as good as our last call or our last live chat. And so therefore we have to, or we've had to create an environment in which everybody is trusted and knows that they are trusted and that they really know what good looks like and what we expect of them and that we wouldn't have them within our four walls if we didn't think that they were capable of of, of achieving all of that and more. Um, so, so, you know, I think that's a really... Um, I think we've, you know, undoubtedly we've created something quite special, um, but but I do think it comes down to that that trust and who is important within within the organisation. And I hope that you know, I know you've been to Money Penny, Lindsay. I hope that as soon as you walk in, you know that that building is not built for for us. It's built for our. It's not built for our clients even. It's built for our our team who walk through our doors every single day and who have got a really tough job, you know, to be bright and confident and capable for. 250 300 people you know different people a day is really hard (laughs) and it's on the point of the building is built for them it's an extraordinary building I mean you've got a tree house you've got the most incredible facilities and you know in fact you when I walked in it's almost I mean it sounds it sounds I I, I don't I can't even describe it you walk in and you're almost greeted with this sort of wall of happiness it's you know everybody is happy (laughs) there you know and the place is looks amazing but everyone's just happy to be there and that's really unusual you know it's I I walk into a lot of buildings and I don't think I've ever experienced that before really no I mean it it sounds all a bit sort of la la doesn't it but but actually I think what it it comes down to many things and, and um 
you know, I think we've been uh, extraordinary. Well, the, the, so in terms of growing it, um, they, it's been great because what we've been able to do is actually recruit people on attitude and not just on aptitude. So actually we're looking for people who want to make each day better. So we're not looking for, you know, cookie cutter people. We're looking for people who, you know, or, or, well, you know, our teams come from a million different backgrounds doing a million different things and, and have a million different interests, but actually they all share something, which is actually they want to make the world a better place in some way. So we're recruiting really positive individuals. And I think they all add up to create a sum that's greater than the, you know, a whole that's greater than the sum of the parts. Um, and you know, recruitment's really important. And I know that the, the people that answer the, the calls and, and the live chats on behalf of your clients, as you've already said, have got a personal relationship with you. So it's not like an out, it, I know it is an outsourced telephone mm. option service, but they're very much part Absolutely, of the yeah, client's yeah. team, aren't they? Because they're the front of house in, in, in many respects, uh, which is for any business a, a hugely vital role. But I know, remember you telling me a story about one of um, a woman that works at Money. Yes, that's right. She was, was she on holday <laughs> in the <laughs> south coast and did yeah, she, she drive yeah. like 100 miles out of her way or something to visit her client? to visit a client and to just say hello because she had not met them face to face. And that was obviously not something she was asked to do. That was something that she felt like she really know, wanted absolutely. to do, you know. Yeah. But at the end of the day, if, if you spend all day talking to people, you know, you build up relationships, don't you? And then you, yeah, you go and yes. you meet people. Um, and that's, yeah, so it's, it's kind of interesting. And so really that leads me on to what another thing I want to talk to you about which is we mind the gap um which is an incredible foundation that supports underprivileged young women mm. uh, sorry underserved young women uh in our in our local communities I mean I'll I'll I'll, I'll leave you to explain more about what that does but this is another reason that I I I I mean, you, I know you, you're going to get embarrassed me saying this, but you're an extraordinary woman because there's many of us that want to do good things. But taking the step of, of putting something together, which was never going to be easy from the start, and is something that very, very few people would do. And I'd like to understand... I'll come on now to talk about we man the world, but I'd like to understand really you em- you empower a lot of people with uh, the way you are. But who who you know where do you get that from? Uh, is that from your parents? Is that from where's your sense of wanting to do the right thing? Where's the, s- the strong sense of that come from? Because you have got that on a on another level to the majority of people. <laughs> I don't know. I feel in- extraordinarily lucky. Um, and I think through, um, I don't know, I just feel really everybody deserves an opportunity. And I think that's that's come from that's come from my parents or from our parents. Um, you know, that's I don't know. I don't know. You know, I, I think everybody, everybody deserves. I, I, I've had an extraordinarily privileged life um, and. And I've always been very aware of that. And, you know, and I, my parents, um, my grandparents have always been. But but then I think we've always been slightly in awe of other extraordinary lives that are going on around us. And I think there are extraordinary things going on every day. And we just don't, you know, we just don't recognise that, you know. And and I think that, you know, the whole in, you know, during COVID, this whole, you know, celebrating the NHS and whatever, it's given us an opportunity to celebrate all these everyday heroes. And I think they're everyday heroes everywhere. But people need to be given an opportunity. People don't need to be heroes, but people need to be given an opportunity to 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 be to to do to be and to do. And I think you know it's human nature is that we want to do good in the world. I really believe that. But that some people just haven't had the opportunity to find their way or and if we can help in that in some way, then that's great. And you know, and through Money Penny, the, the the my biggest joy at Money Penny was seeing our team, members of our team, join us and then amaze themselves at what they were capable of achieving with a bit of support. And I think that that to me is a very simple joy and a very simple thing. Um, 
But then, you know, I just got to think, well, why, you know, everybody at Money Penny has actually been able to walk through our doors clutching their CV, you know. Um, but there are so many people out there who aren't ready to walk through any employer's doors through no fault of their own. Um, and, you know, and I really believe through work comes good stuff. So I just, it, it was a natural thing for me to think, well, what about bringing the kind of support that we, we give to our Money Penny team to a different cohort in our local community? Um, and my natural, you know, event was to, to, to look at um, young women um, in Wrexham, which is where we've set up our, you know, where Money Penny is, is based, um, who haven't had the best had the best start in life. So, so actually, we mind the gap starts off as a very simple idea, which is what would happen if we gave less advantaged people, um, you know, people who absolutely deserve new opportunities, if we gave them a bit of support. And uh, and out of that, you know, I'm so proud of the charity. I mean, it's been the hardest, still is the hardest thing I've ever done, um, but the most the most amazing. Um, and you know, in life, we all through life we collect stories, don't we? So Money Penny for me has been a collection of of wonderful and continues to be a collection of amazing stories. And yet, and then through we mind the gap, those stories have become bigger and bolder and better. Um, because just to see what some of our young women have achieved with a bit of love and care and support is just humbling, absolutely, you know. And can you describe what the what the programme for We Mind the Gap is and um, what what the what what the experience your cohorts have when they? Yep, be be delighted. Um, but just tell me to shut up, Lindsay. <laughs> No, I I, I know I want to listen to you all day, Rachel. I'm never going to tell you to shut up. Basically, what we do at a very simple basis is that we we um, young people are referred to us from places like Leaving Care, Youth Justice, Homeless Hostels, Women's Aid, Bernardo's, um, DWP, and what we do is we for ten young women at a time. Or actually, we're starting our first program for young men next year, um, but so far we've offered this opportunity to about 110 young women um is for 10 young women at a time we 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 set up a program which comprises six months employment and then followed by six months ongoing support followed by lifelong membership of the we mind the gap family um and the whole idea is that within that first six months they learn how it is to be an employee how it is to feel supported how it is to learn new skills and experiences and have a life coach and have people in your life who are cheering you on from the sidelines um, and then that that support carries on in the next 12 months and the next six months when people move from our our six months employment into new employment of their own um, and then they you know they carry on so uh, the you know what we are we are so proud I was just doing some numbers this morning so 70 percent of our uh, people who graduated from our six month employment program are in full-time worker education um, and they're young, you know, they're young women who had no very little opportunity initially um, and just a transformative power of love and care and and just, you know, people are say, you know, supporting you. Um, you know, we've proven that and, um, you know, we're, we're growing. We're growing now. So so we will be running um, in 2020. We'll be running six programmes. So we'll have 60 young people. Um, next year and then the year after that will be 80 and the year after that will be 100. Um, so John Timpson is our patron who is an amazing touchstone for us and keeps telling me to uh, manage my natural inclination to want to grow, grow, grow um, by telling me to keep it small and keep you know the quality of, of make sure that we, we continue being as amazing as we are for it for, um, without compromising it by growing too quickly which is obviously something that I'm very mindful of with you know after my money penny experiences is that it's all about scalability um, and you, you can only grow as fast as you can consistently manage the quality of what it is that you're doing. What we do is completely holistic. And actually, it makes me realise that what we do at Money Penny is completely holistic as well. And we recognise that that there are that if stuff's going on at home that isn't worked out, it's going to affect work. If stuff's going on at work, it's worked out, it's going to affect stuff at home, that there's a very blurred line between the two. And that actually, and these are all very big buzzwords for now, aren't they? It's all about authenticity and the whole person. Um, and that actually we we are who we are 24 hours a day and we just need to, we need all the support and care, especially now 
to be the very best versions of ourselves 24 hours a day. And basically, I think that the system that we all live in, that we all operate in, has really good intentions and it's got great ambitions. But I think that actually the way in which the system is delivered to the people who rely on it doesn't work because it gets the small things wrong. And so, you know, my personal belief is that we, we is that, yes, the only way that we can actually think big and realise big ambitions is if we get all the small things right. So with Money Penny, it's making sure that every last telephone call, every last live chat is handled superbly. Um, within we, we Mind the Gap, it's about making sure that every single one of our, our young people, you know, that, that, we, that if something terrible has happened, that they get a phone call from us or that they get a hug from us, which is difficult in COVID times, isn't it? But that they, that they, that it's the small ways in which we demonstrate our care for the people around us that actually makes people feel cared for and makes, allows them to feel safe and able to do the best that they can do. Um, and yeah, so, so, so I think, you know, thinking big and acting small is a really important thing that, 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 I, I try and do personally, but also that we want to gap tries to do, that Money Penny tries to do, um, and I think that the system, you know, especially right now, is 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 you know finding it impossible to do. Um, and, and that and that quality of, of like saying thinking big, but by basically getting the detail right throughout and maintaining the quality, that's obviously something that was the the, the corner has been the cornerstone of Money Penny from the start. And um, with the so much, so much um, focus, I think in a in a in the world we live at is just grow, grow, grow. I think we lose a lot, don't we? If the if the focus is on the growth rather than the quality and the detail. Yeah, absolutely. It's all it's all in the detail, which is you know I'm not remotely detail driven, and I find that quite hard. But it absolutely is, you know. And for businesses at the moment, for business owners um, who are you know having a challenging time, let's face it, many of them are, and their their focus is 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 maybe trying to keep their businesses afloat or keep themselves profitable. What would your advice be to those people who are hitting, who are experiencing difficult times at the moment? Oh, I mean, God, it's hard, isn't it? It's so hard at the moment. But I actually think that that we have to keep stepping into our customers' shoes every single day because every day the world is shifting. And so people's expectations now are very different to what they were at the beginning of March and they're very different to what they were, you know, six months earlier than that. And so as to survive, we need to be agile and we need to be nimble and we need to be able to change. Um, and the only way in which we can change is if our team comes with us and the only way our, way our team is going to come with us is if we trust them. Because if we tr want to micromanage our team through this massive, massive change, but that, that's just not going to work. You know, we've, we've, you know, Money Penny now, we've got 700 people working from home. Um, you know, nothing to do with me, but our chief exec and our leadership team at Money Penny managed to make that happen within two weeks. And the reason they managed to make that happen was because our team, all of our those 700 people, already feel trusted to do the job that they're doing and they don't have to be micromanaged. So therefore to say to them, okay guys, let's see if we can make this work from home. We've never done this before. Then actually everybody was on the same bus. You know, we all knew that we'd never done this before and we needed to try. Whereas if we pretended, oh, we, we, yeah, of course, this is no, this is no problem. Um, we're going to micromanage you to, we, you know, it, it, we would have just fallen over as an organization. And so I think that, that nowadays, we need to know what what do our customers want, and we have to know that that might be very different to, you know, a few months ago. Um, we also need to so we need to trust, and we need to have people that we can trust within our organisations, and we need to be able to lead. Um, and again, this is all going to sound very buzzy, and I don't mean it to, but we need to be able to lead with authenticity. We 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 cannot say we know all the answers because we really don't. But what we can say is actually we're doing our best. Um, this is what we think is the right thing to do. Do you think this is the right thing to do? Um, and by the way, if you've got any ideas about how we can we can you know um, how we can change and flex to answer this situation, then please share them with us. You know, our the people who know what's what is going on in our businesses are the people who are actually dealing with our customers on a day to day basis. It's not you know. 
And, and most of our leaders in our organisations are not doing that. So actually, those people who are at the front line are more important than, than, than they ever were, because they know what people need now. If you were able to talk to your younger self 20 years ago, starting this off, what would you what would you what would your advice be to yourself now? Um, oh, my God, that's a really difficult question. <laughs> What would my advice be to myself? My advice would be just do it. Um, uh, you know, and I think that we did just do it, but with a lot of agonies along the way. I think I would, well, just in terms of the stuff that we've learned, is it pays to be bloody minded. If you know what you want, do not stop at the first no, go, go, go until you find somebody who says yes. And I can give you a load of examples. But the most obvious example for us is that we were not allowed to be the banks refused to give us direct debit payment facilities. They would now, but you know, it was a long time ago now. Um, and we actually went round all the banks, not once, but twice. And eventually RBS said, yes, you can have direct debit payment facility you know, your, that your customers can pay by direct debit. And it just transformed our business. And it allowed us to change from chasing our clients for money to to finding new clients and, and, you know, and improving our services for our clients and just allowed us to focus completely on a, a completely different bit of the business which was fantastic um but we knew that but we had to really fight for somebody else to believe in us enough to give that you know that thing to us um, and we were told to give up many times um so it's that and then also we've had some really shocking professional advice over the years and i think that we've always assumed that the there are advisors knew best and i think if i was doing this again well, i don't think i know that if i was doing this again I would speak to more advisors. I would invest more time in that. So, you know, we were given some shocking tax advice in the first instance, um, wasted loads and loads of money. And, and it's just because we didn't understand what was going on. But but I think that the, the, the key thing out of that is just don't be afraid of asking the stupid questions. There's always someone else in the room who's relieved you've asked the stupid question. Because A, they don't be stupid. And then B, they, everybody understands better. Yeah, absolutely. Rachel, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you about your journey over the last 20 years thank you for sharing it with me today and I know that there'll be a lot of what you've said will will chime with a lot of people in terms of you know you've been through it you've been through it you've you've grown something incredible from something very incredibly small so thank you for sharing your 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 story and your journey with us it's really much appreciated Thanks for listening. I really hope you enjoyed this episode of In Conversation with Seriously Motivated Entrepreneurs. I'm on a bit of a mission to provide help and support to small businesses, as well as my podcast. I'm working hard to provide lots of helpful and practical advice to help small businesses get really good at business development and marketing, from free masterclasses and cheat sheets to downloadable guides and consultancy sessions. If you would like to access this information, it's all available on my website, agnesmarketing.co.uk. And if you'd like to join our Facebook community of other small businesses looking to access and share marketing advice, tips and support, please search for Agnes Marketing on Facebook. And would you mind if I ask you something? If you've liked what you've listened to today, can you please rate, review and subscribe to this podcast as it will help other business owners to find it and it might just provide the inspiration and motivation they need at this moment in time. Thanks so much.